hello and happy Valentine's Day and for the coming weekend of course from San Francisco and uh, also joined by one of my esteemed colleagues Dr. Axel Meseberger from who is a surgical oncologist a urologic oncologist as you know very well an expert in our field and um, we have been through the first days of GUASCO. It's still ongoing. It's, as always, a very interesting meeting to interact, to produce not only new data, but also plan new studies. So, Axel, um, as a professor and an expert in the field, you come from the scholarly side of things. And we just heard last week that apalutamide got the approval and the indication for use not just now in the non-metastatic CRPC, but also in the very important metastatic hormone-naive uh, prostate cancer space. What are your thoughts and what are the implications for our patients and our pr providers, our practitioners, of course? So, um, Eleni, thanks for, for having me here. Great pleasure to, to exchange uh, news with you, as always. So, um, um, we have had, um, I would say, a year of MHSPC in 2019 with the ICHAS trial um, being presented a year ago in the same city we are sitting right now. We had Ensamet at ASCO presented by Chris Sweeney, which changed a lot, and also the New England publication and presentation by Kim Chi on Titan. As uh, we recall, Titan uh, included more than 1,000 men with uh, metastatic prostate cancer. They could have been treated at the primary. They could have been have radiation, prior doxotaxel, and they were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion towards uh, apalutamide and ADT, or the, at that time standard, just ADT. This uh, resulted in really a remarkable radiographic progression-free survival benefit for the arm that received the combination of APA and ADT. Very highly statistical significant overall survival as well for the combination. So we have a new situation in MHSPC in 2020 where we are fortunate to just have this uh, approval a couple of weeks ago in Europe uh, to use apalutamide in those patients with uh, metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. So th this is of course you were just discussing before we walked in, uh, in, this, uh, in this interview how you're able to now prescribe but you're also very experienced because you've been part of all the trials. You've used it a lot mm. in that setting, and you keep also interrogating the disease with other such agents. Mm. But for those physicians who are going to be now using it for the first time, and it looks like the impact is really remarkable when it comes to overall survival. And on top of it, I think we all agree that now, in 2020, we've had 11 phase three trials with novel androgen signal inhibitors all positive, and the data is compelling that as you come earlier in the disease, the impact mm -hmm. is higher and stronger. So do you think there is still a place for a physician to tell a patient, I'm only going to give you luprolide or an LHRH agonist or antagonist, I'm going to say. As a scholar, what would your thoughts be? It's a very important point you're tickling out there because um, we still should somehow look at the risk and the volume, and we have the high-risk situation, and we have the low-volume or high-volume um, patients with a lot of metastasis or high PSA, visceral disease, high Gleason. Um, and here, um, I can only think of a situation where you have a low-volume oligometastatic disease patient and a low-risk profile, which is very rare, where up to Titan, we would have no real indication for abiraterone or doxotaxel in this setting. It so, tested. correct, correct. Right, right. On, only this. It would probably work, but uh, I mean, we have those stampede data also showing um, that there's an effect of doxotaxel. So, I think definitely being on your side, ADT is not enough for MHSPC patients. And now we have the Titan data where we have an all comer indication. So, regardless of prior therapy, regardless of volume, you don't really have to think anymore for speaking urologist or um, surgeon oncologist, which is easy. You don't have to really calculate a lot and count the, the bone mats. Right. And so you can use it in all patients with, uh, let's say, just the oligometastatic situation. So this is easy. This is good. And um, also, 
what we've seen yesterday, um, the presentation from Dr. Agarwal on the PFS2, and I, I found it to be very interesting looking at this PFS2, so not only the first progression, but also the second progression, where regardless of the second treatment, whether it is um, chemotherapy or a second hormone therapy, the benefit for the combination with albiraterone was proven. And just demonstrate Which speaks this. more to earlier is better. It is yes. like we should not wait. During, you have been also in these meetings where we're, we're sitting together to figure out how we can promote education to our fellow colleagues who are out there in the community and don't have the privileges that we entertain in our institutions and need to know how to act. So we're seeing that in the United States, where we have had access to the novel androgen signal inhibitors, for now almost, we're getting in the third year, the uptake is not what it should be. We only see 10 to 20 percent of prescription and no use of chemotherapy, by the way, which is, yes. there may be a place. And you bring it all together because in Germany, the urologists also treat with cytotoxic. So you have a choice. It's yes. not like you're limited yes. like others. So I think you're in the perfect position to comment on how we can go about getting better. You mentioned this evidence, and it's somehow scary or like uh, surprising that after five years post uh, um, chartered trial, there's still like a lot of hesitation to use those novel agents. So I think, especially within those hormonal treatment options we have now, uh, we should be going along with the evidence, with uh, um, educating the doctors. Um, speaking to the patient that we really have an overall survival benefit, that we have a can, uh, slow progression of the disease. And I think here, and you mentioned M0 CRPC, where we speak about MFS and those endpoints, which are not a deadly disease, well, but in um, metastatic prostate cancer, we really have a deadly disease with an overall survival median of about three years. So I think here it's well invested to educate the colleagues to start early and that ADT is not enough and you should combine either with apalutamide, doxetaxel, or enzalutamide as some options. So to that point, because also you have the opportunity to experience both the cytotoxic and also all the novel androgen signal inhibitors in your practice, do you have any concerns with the use of apalutamide? Because we've seen the numbers, and just my humble opinion is when the patient just starts LHRH, mm -hmm. There is an impact on the patient, regardless of the addition of yes. apalutamide and any other inhi inhibitor. And the, the, added, the added toxicity is not that remarkable. It's yes. limited. But would you have any special considerations for subgroups of patients? So I think a patient and also doctors should be aware of some different toxicity. For example, the rash which is occurring in about 20% of the patients. It's good to handle, but you have to know when the patient develops a rash. Um, and earlier is true. better there too, right? That's you true. need to, That's yeah. You need to. And we've experienced once you stop and maybe use corticosteroids and you start again, in most cases, the rash never appears again. It's, it's odd, I don't know the mechanism of action behind that, but it's something that happens. So what you mentioned, I totally agree. The biggest impact for the man with uh, metastatic prostate cancer is the ADT because it changes a lot metabolically, um, libido-wise, with regards to weight gain and everything um, which is associated to the ADT. When you add on another um, androgen targeting agents, the different, you have um, a, a good combination there, totally different than the side effects you have with doxetaxel. So you're very comfortable giving it, right? Yes, yes. Who would you have follow? Is it you? Is it your fellows? Is it your, like in your practice? The toxicity monitoring. You have to see yep. these patients. Yep. I mean, you have to prevent them from other things yep. happening. How would you go about doing it? So initially, I recommend to see the patients every couple of weeks okay. to see to how they feel and um, draw blood and um, discuss like uh, side effects and talk to them. Um, then Mainly because, I'm sorry to interrupt again, yep. they're starting something new, yes, a new yes, journey. Yes, yes, yes. It's not because of the specific yeah. drugs. They need to get a true accustomed. And then you have every three months the yeah. ADT. Thanks. Maybe you have um, bisphosphamide, uh, like some substances for, right. for bone protection where you need to see the patient every month. So you have a lot of intervals to have a chance to see the patient. Also, every three months maybe an imaging is good advice to see how, um, uh, how the disease is behaving. I've always said that urologists know the disease 
better sometimes than oncologists, but this is probably going to go public that I said it. So I would say that it has to do with the specific physicians. We should agree. Yeah. And I think treatment, right? the That's multidisciplinary a working together, as we've shown yeah. today, I think yeah. it's important, it and works. that's it what works. we also use in the German setting, like an MDT, uh, once a week. Well, I'm sure that Europe is going to exhibit very high standards, and education, thanks to scholars like you, will will have very high levels. Thank you so much thanks for this a lot. discussion. Thanks Thank, you Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.